welcome to Android Dialogues, where we have bite-sized conversations with people in the Android community. I'm Huyen Dao, and I'm speaking with... Michael Bailey. And we currently are in San Francisco for DroidCon San Francisco. And I'm really excited to have Michael on the show. I, I say that a lot. I'm, I'm excited about a lot of people having a lot of people on the show. But uh, Michael Bailey was actually one of the first people we interviewed for Android Dialogues, uh, although you might have not have seen it because our audio setup was bad and we didn't want to subject you to that. But we are really glad to finally have Michael on the show, and especially since he was so nice as to agree to interview with us when we were just two girls running around I.O. with a camcorder in people's faces. So thanks, Michael. And I'm happy to, so happy, happy to be here. Thanks for having me again. So, Michael, where are you based, and how did you get started in Android? So, I am based in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, I got started in Android kind of um, by chance. I was at the right time at the right place. Uh, so, I've worked at American Express for um, quite a while, seven and a half years. And back in the day, I was working on a project. It used to be a thing called Amex Labs. That was kind of uh, petering down, and mobile was the thing. So, they really wanted to do iPhone. And when uh, part of my teammates were doing the iPhone thing, I knew Java, I saw this Android thing. Um, I had been to Google I.O. In, in 2008. And so I said, I could try this. So I looked at what the guys were doing on iPhone and I started doing that on Android as well. And it became a project. People said, yes, let's do that. And you know, that's how I became the original Android <laughs> developer at uh, American Express. And I still work on that app today. Um, with a lot more people who make it uh, really awesome um, than just me when I was just learning Android, but oh, it's been awesome. a great journey. So, what was, what was your what would you say what was that first SDK that you worked on? Let's see. I think I think by the time we shipped it, uh, we probably supported 2.1 and above. Um, oh. You know, probably the discussion was, do we support 1.6? And I think we decided that we never supported 1.6 and okay. one with 2.1. So, so it's been, it's been, Android's come a long way uh, since then. And um, if you haven't uh, seen Michael's like talks, the presentation, he, he gives lots of great talks um, at conferences about all things Android since he's been around uh, and like knows a lot of great stuff. And I think one of the things that, you know, you've given talks on before is Android Studio. And I guess, can you maybe talk about like, I guess maybe your favorite parts of Android Studio and how like, um, I guess you've seen the progress from when we used to use <coughs> Eclipse and other things like that to using Android Studio and, and maybe kind of like what are your favorite parts or, or favorite features of Android Studio? Yeah, so my uh, experience with Eclipse is actually very limited. So even before Android Studio, I used IntelliJ with the Android plugin. And that was mainly because when I came to Android, I was already very familiar with IntelliJ. So I think IntelliJ, now they've changed their version numbers, um, but they're roughly version 16 now. Yeah. I started using IntelliJ at version 2.5. Oh, wow. So over 10 years, I was using IntelliJ. So when they announced that they were switching from Eclipse to Intelli or, uh, Android Studio as like full-fledged Google support, mm -hmm. I was super excited. Um, that was one of the best uh, I.O. announcements um, I think I've ever seen. Um, I think the thing that really... Um, I, I, probably say, and my coworkers will tell you, I'm a bit of a JetBrains fanboy, but I'm always saying, you know, um, use some sort of JetBrains IDE. I think one of the things that I really like is you just can feel that it was written by developers for developers. Right. And okay. they really, you know, as a product for developers, they think of all these things that maybe I wouldn't have even thought of, but when you discover them, um, it's really great. Uh, keyboard shortcuts um, is really how you unleash the power of any kind of uh, IntelliJ-based uh, product. Mm -hmm. um, and the code editor and the, um, the code completion and just how it knows, seems to know more about your code than you do um, is just <laughs> uh, super comforting and, and powerful. And the other thing that is really great is if you learn those keyboard shortcuts and you need to do some polyglot development, you could take those same ones. You can go to App Code, which is an uh, Objective C. Mm -hmm. um, they have Ruby, all these different things. So you can kind of um, multiply your skills by just learning that IntelliJ uh, platform and be able to uh, play in all these different technologies, not just Android. Yeah, definitely. Consistency is always really nice. I mm. think, and that's that's a really good point. I never thought about that. So I mean, I guess if you are a polyglot, that that's just even more reason to switch to Intel uh, IntelliJ slash Android Studio if you haven't already. And you know, like I feel like, um, especially like, because you were at the end of Android Dev Summit, um, I was too, and they had so many great announcements surrounding, you know, Android Studio 2.0. Um, you know, and it's it's really nice how they kind of just specifically said, you know, all the new features that come out in IntelliJ get, you know, kind of just very immediately brought over to Android mm -hmm. Studio. So there's never there's always like parity between the two, which yep. is really great. But you know, one of the things that um, they talked about a lot at the End Dev Summit 
was kind of speed ups, you know, like, and that was kind of like something that we all have been complaining about is like, oh, it takes so long for my, like, you know, for my bill to build, it takes so long to actually, you know, push or pull anything via ADB. And we were actually talking a little bit before, and Michael's been working a lot on speeding up build processes, like, kind of like, at, at your current, like, um, on your current uh, work. Yes, yeah, so I've been, um, opening up pull requests with some tweaks to our build.gradle to speed up um, specifically during development time. Um, so there's when it builds on the build server and you want that to be fast, but really that core loop of edit the code, compile it, see it on a device is what you want to be fast. Yeah. Um, so there's things in the build that make a lot of sense um, when you're doing it on a, a build server and you're trying to create a release. Um, to distribute to people, mm -hmm. um, but maybe they're not 100% necessary when you're just doing that edit, compile, run, test loop, mm -hmm. um, when you're heads down doing development. So for example, things like the Crashlytics plugin. It, when you're doing um, a rebuild and deploy just for development, you probably don't need all the Crashlytics stuff where it, um, it puts in the API key and all this stuff, so if you can um, have like a build where you kind of comment out or we call it fast build for lack of a better word it probably could come up with a better thing where <laughs> um, we have certain parts of our, our Gradle file where we say if we're in fast build or development mode or whatever you want to call it this is not 100% necessary in, the, in that kind of shortest loop. Now even during development sometimes you want to make sure that all the stuff still works when you check it in so yeah, you can so kind of we have a way to kind of turn that off and do a more full build locally so the developer can make sure it's actually going to work on the CI server mm -hmm. and for other developers but you know so we really concentrated on um, removing things in this fast build mode um, like maybe Crashlytics or for example we take some information from Git and put it in there so we know how it was built but we don't really need that in that fast loop so we can just you know put in data there that's not actually from your Git branch or whatever um, in that fast loop so all these little things that uh, you know basically go through your Gradle file and say if I didn't have this when I'm heads down doing that quick compile edit cycle would it still work for me? Right, And right. kind of um, breaking those out and separating those out um, so that you have a way to kind of disable all those things when you need to and make things faster. Oh, interesting. Was that like, so coming kind of to that, like your, your fast build, was that like an iterative process where you're just like, hey, like, why don't we turn this off? Or hey, what, like, how did you actually kind of get to this point where you're like, hey, we don't need all these things and crash analytics that we don't, you know, that's, it's fine to turn off. Now. Was it like an iterative process or just more like we need to make things faster? What can we do? Well, we've had it, that concept for a while. Um, we have, we use flavors and, and build variants a lot of ways, but again, we have certain variants that really aren't needed during the development cycle, right. but they do provide value in terms of generating certain variants on the build server. Mm -hmm. um, so we had initially said, well, let's just not build those on all the developers machines so we can kind of just comment it out and make things a little faster. When Instant Run came along, um, you know, I started looking like how, you know, how fast can I get it when I just change one string in a resource file? Mm -hmm. So what are all the things, and there's a thing in, um, Gradle has a thing, and it's not specific to Android, but you can do Gradle um, dash dash profile, and it'll give you like where is the time spent um, doing different things in your Gradle file. Oh, nice. And so you can go through there, and then it gives you a nice HTML report, and you can say, okay, why is this line taking so long? Or do I even need that thing to run or that task to actually run during development, or could I just not have that task run um, during development, um, or that variant, or whatever it is uh, in your build? Um, so just going cool. through that and kind of separating out the stuff that's like critical for development versus, you know, the fuller thing that you might be doing on your CI server. Oh, that's really great. And that's a really great informed way of doing it. I, I kind of like, I can imagine myself kind of doing it like, you know, trial and error, like, how about this thing? How about that thing? But that's a much smarter way of doing it with a lot of information on hand. So do you find that like it, it kind of like fits in well with kind of like the instant run and all the other kind of like turboing? of like the whole build process that Android Studio 2.0 is providing, you find it fits well? Yeah, I mean it was really, you know, I was trying to get the most out of Instant Run, um, you know, trying to, we're upgrading our Gradle plugin, and so as part of that I wanted to make sure that we could um, get the most out of Instant Run and provide as much feedback as possible um, to the build team saying, uh, at, you know, filing bugs and things saying like, hey, this is not working for what this is. And so I wanted to remove anything that may be just kind of specific to our process mm -hmm. and kind of um, get our build um, 
build loop down to the smallest thing and then see how Instant Run did for us. Is there anything that's kind of surprising to you that kind of took, like, ate up some time that you didn't expect it to? Um, I think Gradle always is a little bit surprising for me. Um, you know, Groovy is not my favorite, but, um, you know, it's certainly powerful. You can do a lot of things, but you, it's, it's really easy sometimes, I think, in Groovy to just say, oh, well, this would be cool if I did it, and you check it in, and it works, and the build script works, but if you're not careful about everything that you add to your Gradle file, like, oh, how is this going to slow us down on CI server? How is this going to slow us down on development? It's easy to add something in your Gradle file that seems innocent and not going to slow you down, but later you figure out, like, oh, well, this compi this um, forces this task to always run and things like that. Right, yeah. Um, there was one thing, I think, that uh, did surprise me, and it had to do with... It was when you have a large number of dependencies on certain compile tasks, and I think I filed an um, uh, issue on v.android for this, but we found that it wasn't always deterministic, the class path that it passed to the compiler, so occasionally it would reorder things and so that it, think that need to re it thought it needed to recompile even when it actually didn't because it would just like said this jar is now in front of this jar. Oh. So we actually did a workaround um, to force um, force a certain ordering of all of the things on the class path so that it was um, deterministic. Um, so, you know, I don't know enough about all of that to know that it wasn't something we were doing versus a, um, a bug, but I always file those things so at least the tools can, can tell us like, oh, hey, you're doing this thing that you shouldn't be doing. Or sometimes, you know, it is a genuine issue that we found and they'll fix it. So Michael's actually speaking at DroidCon San Francisco. Michael, what's your topic this time around on? So I'm, I'm going over how we use the new uh, Google Cloud Test Lab in our CI environment. Um, I'm co-presenting with um, Ahmed from Google. Uh, he is the product manager for Cloud Test Lab. Um, so he's talking about the product and I'm talking about specifically how we've uh, utilized that product um, in, the, uh, in our continuous integration environment. And they were very kind to us. We got very early access. We were one of the very first customers for Cloud Test Lab. They actually came to our office and sat down with us um, and showed us how it worked and stuff. So um, and we took that and over the, the past months we've um, uh, made iterations on really making it work for us on CI. So, Michael, it was awesome talking to you. Finally, to get you on the show, I'm so excited. Uh, if people wanted to find you on the internet, where can they do that? I'm active on Twitter. You can find me at Yogurt Earl on Twitter. One of my favorite screen names, like, ever. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so thank you so much, Michael, and uh, thank you guys, and we'll see you later. Thanks. Bye. Bye.